In 2018, Matt Beggs won his second Texas State High School Wrestling Championship, to the dismay of many fellow competitors and their parents, some of whom withdrew from their matches rather than subject themselves to almost certain defeat. Matt Beggs is transgender and had been on masculinizing hormone replacement therapy in the form of low-dose testosterone injections. However, despite the advantages that testosterone gave him, including increased muscle mass and strength, the University Interscholastic League decided that he would be forced to compete in the girls' division since his birth certificate wasn't legally updated at the time and wouldn't be until January 2019. Mack expressed a preference to compete in the boys' division, even though he knew it would be much more difficult, since his competitors would have been building muscle on testosterone much longer than he ever had a chance to. Nevertheless, he competed in the girls' division and predictably took the championship. Mack Beggs is a talented wrestler, even when competing against other boys. The same year as this story, he competed in the men's junior division of USA Wrestling, placing third in both Greco-Roman and freestyle wrestling. Max's situation brings up several interesting issues for martial arts and combat sports. In addition to weight classes, the WKF, UFC, Bellator, and several other martial arts or combat sports competitions have competitors fight against competitors of their same gender. Even in forms or content divisions, men are judged against men, and women are judged against women. We live in a world where, fortunately, transgender people are receiving more and more acceptance and recognition in society. In many sports, however, this has led to a backlash against transgender athletes who, it's claimed, are unfairly advantaged against their cisgender counterparts. However, the reasons that are cited to make this claim can often result in complex and difficult cases, such as the following one. Castor Semenya is not transgender, but many of her competitors have suspected her of having a hormonal advantage, and as a result, she's found herself at the center of the discourse around a recent rule requiring that female competitors with testosterone above a certain level take medication to lower their testosterone before competing. Her assumed natural advantage has been compared to athletes like Michael Phelps, an Olympic swimmer with joints that allow him to swim faster than many competitors, who is still allowed to swim against other swimmers who do not have that advantage. While there isn't any clear indication that her testosterone levels are higher than other female runners, this speculation was clearly the justification for the ruling by the International Association of Athletics Federations, especially since the ruling only covered the 400, 800, and 1500 meter runs, all events where she competed. Transgender women face similar criticism, with some people claiming that their bodies might naturally produce enough testosterone to give them an advantage. Like with other talking points about transgender women, much of this rhetoric relies on a lack of knowledge about transgender bodies. I would like to start off this video by saying that trans women are women, trans men are men, and non-binary people are non-binary. Additionally, transgender people do not need to have dysphoria or to pursue medical transition in order to be valid in their gender identity. I want to get this out of the way, since I know that there are quite a few groups who disagree with those statements, and there might even be some trans people watching who worry that I'm going to support these trans-exclusionary or trans-medicalist viewpoints. If this video gets any comments that are bigoted, I will delete them. Additionally, this video comes with the obvious trigger warning that I will be discussing transphobia, transphobic harassment, and physical injury. I'll try not to be too graphic, but if those are difficult topics for you, please switch to a different video if you need to, and take care of your mental health. With that warning out of the way, I'd like to focus back on what this channel is about, martial arts and karate specifically. I've been training karate for 18 years, so it's no surprise that I've met several trans karateka at various stages of their journey of discovery and transition, and at various stages in their training. I've also been keeping up with the martial arts community online, and have run into a fair number of people wondering if karate is an accepting community towards their gender identity. These experiences have inspired me to want to investigate how the martial arts community treats its transgender members, and what we can learn from the problems that sometimes arise. I'm the Goju-Ryu philosopher, and let's get into it. In many, but not all, trans people go through a process called hormone replacement therapy, or HRT. This isn't a uniquely trans process. Some menopausal women receive HRT to deal with problems related to declining estrogen levels. In fact, this is the most common use, or at least the first several results on Google when you search for it. For trans people specifically, there are generally two types of HRT, masculinizing and feminizing, based on the gender identity of the patient. Feminizing, or estrogenizing HRT, usually consists of estrogen and a testosterone blocker, with some doctors choosing to add progesterone, which is said to enhance the effects of estrogen. Masculinizing, or testosteronizing HRT, is much simpler, usually only requiring testosterone itself, either through injection, creams, gels, or patches. Both types of HRT can affect things such as fat distribution, and trans women begin to grow breasts while on estrogen, though usually this takes a fairly long time and has a limited effect. Testosterone can increase muscle mass, 
while testosterone blockers can diminish muscle mass. There's some controversy over whether estrogen and blockers actively decrease muscle mass, but at the very least, they make it harder to regain should the muscle atrophy. The changes that take place on HRT aren't immediate, but most changes are partially or fully irreversible. Generally, after being on HRT for a while, trans people have hormone levels more or less consistent with cisgender people of the same gender. However, there are certain things that HRT can't change, like bone structure, and while it can impact your height and foot size, this is because of changes to ligament structure, not the underlying bones. There are also several conditions, such as baldness, facial hair growth, and menstruation, that are affected by this process, but may or may not go away entirely. This isn't a complete list of the effects of hormone replacement therapy by any means, but hopefully it can serve as a useful starting point for us to understand some of the common physical experiences of trans people and to get us starting on the same page. In bring to the USA NKF, the governing body for sport karate in America, transgender athletes are not barred from competing in karate at the national level. Their guidelines to trans athletes are based on the 2003 Stockholm Consensus on Sex Reassignment in Sports, and include the following provisions. First off, trans people of all kinds who began their medical transition prior to puberty, who generally haven't developed the secondary sex characteristics associated with their sex assigned at birth, are eligible to compete in the division corresponding to their gender. Those who transition after puberty are treated differently. The rules only cover trans men and trans women, so non-binary people whose gender experience and transition may look vastly different are not represented very well. Trans men are only required to declare that they are male to compete in the men's division, but trans women are restricted from the women's division until their testosterone has been below a certain cutoff for 12 months, and any deviation above this amount results in 12 months of ineligibility. Additionally, while this does not seem to be the case for their male counterparts, trans women are not able to change their gender declaration for four years after declaring themselves women. The guidelines also single out cis women with hyperandrogenism, or higher than normal levels of testosterone. These women are barred from competing in the female category if their androgen levels are in the male range, unless they have an androgen resistance. Should a woman not qualify for the women's competition, however, she is allowed to compete in the men's division. This is a similar situation to Castor Semenya, as we discussed in this video's introduction. From these regulations, we can see that the USANKF takes a similar view to transgender identity as many other sports governing bodies, which is that gender is to some degree hormonal, and must be proven through hormone tests in certain ways. What's especially telling is the difference between rules for trans men and trans women, in which the latter are much more heavily scrutinized than the former. This seems to align with a common fear that men are attempting to gain an advantage in sports by pretending to be transgender and competing with a biologically superior testosterone-based body. Of course, the USANKF's rules only affect martial artists who take part in competitions, which not everyone does. Later in this video, I'll take a look at this idea that trans women are secretly better suited to sports than their cis-female competitors, and I was very intentional in opening with a story about a trans man rather than a trans woman, which I feel demonstrates that this fear is somewhat misplaced. But for now, I want to take a look at transgender people's experiences in martial arts outside of just competing. Some dojos are very accepting, and some are not, just like any other type of community. I've recently stumbled onto the Budobler community of martial artists on Tumblr, which has been very accepting of martial artists of all LGBT identities. In fairness, Tumblr communities are often progressive and accepting of LGBT identities in general, but the outpouring of support was inspiring. Martial arts communities can be accepting towards trans people, and quite simply, some don't care. Martial arts classes which are co-ed, as the majority that I've been to are, don't distinguish training between genders in any case, so it would make very little sense for them to do so with transgender martial artists specifically. Some dojos do teach women's self-defense, which can often include some inaccurate portrayals both of women's capability and of appropriate self-defense techniques, as Channel Hard to Hurt made an excellent video on. This can be a factor that impacts both cis female and closeted trans male martial artists, leading them to be taught ineffective techniques, and in general it stigmatizes all female martial artists. There are also some transgender self-defense techniques as well, which I worry could fall into the same trap of misrepresenting and stigmatizing trans people's capability and varied experience. On the whole, however, trans people in martial arts can be treated as acceptingly or unacceptingly as their individual community decides to treat them. A video that I found while initially researching this topic discusses some of the ways that being partially closeted as a martial artist impacts someone's training. As with being partially or fully closeted in any setting, the constant misgendering can wear a martial artist down and make them feel uncomfortable in the dojo. 
However, this video is at least an encouraging look into the possibility of trans people being accepted by their families in the dojo, so please check it out. That said, not every dojo is as lenient or accepting as the one in this example. In 2018, Vortex Sports Academy, a martial arts school in Leander, Texas, caught a lot of flack for their policy of referring to people by the pronoun that refers to their biological sex. Many of the arguments made by the school and its supporters have been heard as criticisms of transgender people before in a variety of contexts. The school's owner said that the policy was intended to not expose kids to the social challenge of transgender existence, citing the uncomfortableness of parents as the impetus for this policy. He referred to his school as one that taught traditional values, and said that allowing people to be referred to by the pronouns of their self-identity would be pandering to transgender children. This policy was brought to light when a trans woman offered to teach a class, since she had received a black belt from the school prior to her transition, and was denied, leading to a heated public argument. She states that the school's owner harassed her over text, and had at one point attempted to dissuade her from being public with her gender identity by mentioning the rate of suicide among transgender people. One of Vortex's parents said in an interview that the martial arts school needed to be G-rated for the kids, and that it was parents' job to teach their kids about trans identities. However, another parent refused to send her children to the academy, saying that trans identity is not a complicated thing to explain to kids, nor is it inappropriate in any way, in that anyone who thinks that kids can't handle that aren't giving them much credit. I'm using this example as a framing device partially because there's a lot of information on the situation, and partially because I think it speaks to something very important about trans identity. First off, biological pronouns. Many much smarter and more established YouTubers than me have talked about the ridiculousness of claiming that the essence of pronouns is biological. The very short version of this argument is that pronouns have existed long before biology was understood to the degree it is today. The use of pronouns is almost always to designate the social role that someone fills. Some trans people pass, meaning that they look like cisgender people of their same gender to strangers, or otherwise intuitively seem like the gender that they are, even to people who might not believe the abstract truth that trans people are the gender that they say they are. To check whether a woman or a man is trans might require looking in their pants, taking a medical panel, or somehow acquiring their birth certificate, depending on the status of their transition. I don't think that I have to say how these things could be considered invasions of privacy. I also have a personal experience with the fact that pronouns aren't biological in a simple, stupid, and straightforward way. As you can see, I have long hair. Because of this, I've had many people assume that I'm a girl and call me ma'am, miss, or that girl over there. I present male in public, but even this small attribute has caused people to attribute different genders to me. Once, I was walking on the street and I heard a child ask, who's that lady over there? To which their mother corrected them, no, that's a boy. However, neither of them knew anything about my biology. If pronouns were biological in nature, how is it possible that this mistake could be made? How is anyone supposed to check what the biologically correct pronouns even are? Next, there's the clear implication that the existence of trans people is somehow predatory or sexual. This is the reason behind the controversial trans bathroom bills that were passed and struck down in several states in America. This is usually a criticism that's aimed at trans women, who critics view as predatory men looking to invade women's spaces and commit assault. And I could talk about how there are very few incidents of people claiming to be trans to assault anyone. I could talk about the fact that this position infantilizes and disregards trans men. But since the point that I'm trying to make is specifically that trans identity isn't inherently sexual, I'd just like to point out that this line of reasoning is very similar to the exclusion of gay and lesbian issues from children's media under the Hayes Code and similar ideologies. While martial arts contains physical contact, that contact is entirely unsexual. If trans identity was a sexual fetish, martial arts, especially ones that don't include grappling, would provide absolutely no satisfaction of that desire. Not to mention that, in the context of this school, the very first reason that Vortex's owner had to create this policy was a child student asking to be referred to in a gender-neutral way. The idea that this topic is too mature or difficult to introduce kids to is ridiculous when kids themselves are dealing with it and bringing it up. Not to mention the fact that simply referring to a trans person by pronouns that they ask you to isn't teaching kids about trans identity, but interacting with trans people, who are already a facet of the world that these kids live in and will grow up in, as people. If anything, it makes parents more likely to teach their kids about trans identity on their own, since it gives them an example that they can easily understand. Lastly, I want to look at the idea of traditional values. Whenever this phrase is brought up, it's worth asking what the traditions are that are being referred to. In this case, it's unclear whether the traditions are related to the martial art, or to the traditions or the culture of Leander, Texas, or America in general. Transphobia in East Asia and East Asian martial arts is its own topic, 
which I won't be covering here, and so is the United States' history of LGBT discrimination. However, I will simply offer the insight that traditions can and do change. Practicing karate in a gi is nowadays seen as traditional, and yet it was only adopted a century ago. When people make appeals to traditional values, they're usually assuming a shared tradition that translates to their personal politics projected back onto history. What counts as traditional to someone might not seem so traditional to others, and so appeals to traditional values have to either explain and justify this, or be seen as what they are ad hoc appeals to shared bigotry. Fortunately, there are still many dojos that are not like Vortex, and some trans people are even able to make careers in martial arts as instructors. In the sources of this video, there are a few stories of people being recognized and supported by their dojos during transition. Hopefully for any trans martial artists in the audience, these stories will be able to demonstrate that you can be safe and out in your dojo or gym. Next, however, I'd like to take a look at transgender competitors in professional combat sports. In one of the most popular podcasts that I've heard about through YouTube is The Joe Rogan Experience, and its host often covers martial arts and combat sports. Beginning in 1997, Rogan was a commentator for UFC, a position that he held on and off for almost 20 years. His podcast began in December of 2009 and has been running through to the present. He recently signed a licensing deal with Spotify, which will begin offering the podcast in September of this year before it becomes exclusive in January 2021. Back in 2013, Rogan addressed the transgender UFC fighter Fallon Fox, who was forcibly outed to the UFC community in March of that year after having fought professionally twice before. Fallon transitioned in 2006 in Thailand and had been living as a woman ever since then, but Rogan posited that having gone through male puberty had given her advantages such as bone density, bigger hands and shoulder joints, and thicker wrists that let her punch much harder than a woman can. Other public figures joined onto this criticism, including the CEO of UFC, Dana White, who obviously cares about the safety of UFC fighters. Due to the publicly available information about Fallon's transition, it's almost certain that she's lost any of the benefits of a testosterone body, but it is certainly correct that transition doesn't change bone size, and the only common surgery that deals with bone structure at all is facial feminization surgery, which doesn't impact one's ability to fight. However, claims about trans women having higher bone density are contradicted by some medical studies, one of which states that lumbar spine density was lower than in reference men, but similar to that of reference women. Nevertheless, the controversy around Fallon continued. In 2014, she fought Tamika Brents, and in the first round, Fallon won by technical knockout. Tamika was injured during the fight, suffering an orbital fracture and concussion, and required seven staples to the head. Tamika later expressed her opinions on the fight, claiming that she felt more overpowered than ever before and was unable to move around in Fallon's clinch, as a way of calling into question the propriety of her fighting in the women's division. People used this fight to push the opinion that Fallon was dangerous, with some even suggesting that she fought in the women's division as a sort of male aggression, wanting to get paid for beating up women. Now, as it turns out, orbital bone fractures happen in MMA, both in men's and women's fights. Tony Ferguson and Miesha Tate both suffered orbital bone fractures in UFC fights, and the latter even went on to win that fight despite her injury. However, the severity of the injury that Fallon inflicted on Tamika was used to fuel scaremongering about her overwhelming advantage. However, despite this advantage, Fallon Fox had lost her fourth professional fight to Ashley Evans Smith, indicating that perhaps there was more to her victories than simple bone structure advantage. The famous UFC fighter Ronda Rousey claimed that she would be able to knock out Fallon despite her unfair advantage, but such a fight never materialized, and Fallon retired after her bout with Tamika. Quite frankly, a lot of the discourse around Fallon Fox was quite vitriolic and transphobic, with many people discussing the status of her genitalia. I've chosen not to include footage from Rogan's 2018 reflection on the controversy, or any of the nasty quotes from Rogan, White, Rousey, and others, but there are several links in the description of this video if you'd like to watch that video and read articles written about the situation from several perspectives, some of which I disagree with. Trigger warning for, among other things, footage of severe injury, transphobia, transmisogyny, and PragerU videos. Of course, Fallon Fox is not the only transgender person in the combat sports world. Patricio Manuel, a boxer and trans man, became the first transgender boxer to have a professional fight in 2018 against Hugo Aguilar, who was very respectful of his gender identity. Though Manuel hasn't fought professionally since then, in 2019 he was made the face of Everlast, a universally acclaimed boxing brand. There seems to have been comparatively little controversy about his victory, especially looking at the utter hatred and vitriol that Fallon Fox received. 
This section of the video is going to be many times shorter, merely because there's very little to talk about. But this disparity brings up a question that I think is interesting. Why do trans women receive so much scrutiny in martial arts and sports, whereas trans men generally don't? In As I mentioned towards the beginning of this video, the USANKF only requires trans men to declare their gender, but has specific requirements for the hormone levels of trans women looking to compete as women. This, I think, is indicative of a trend in the discussion of trans people in sports, which is the shockingly common assumption that trans women are really men looking to gain an advantage by competing against women, who they are supposedly advantaged of. The example of Mac Beggs that I opened this video with demonstrates that this might not be the most appropriate concern. Taking testosterone may improve an athlete's ability to compete when compared to cisgender women, whereas trans women often undergo hormone therapy that results in their physical abilities and hormone levels being on par with cisgender women. A lot of scrutiny is placed on trans women's bodies in professional sports, and they are almost always treated as men's bodies rather than women's bodies, regardless of the state of their medical transition. I believe that this is an example of the way that trans women are treated, on the whole, as predatory men by transphobes, whereas trans men are often viewed as confused or boyish but ultimately harmless women. Here's where I start quoting philosophers on a channel where I call myself a philosopher, so strap in. In her book The Second Sex, Simone de Beauvoir borrows from the Hegelian master-slave dialectic when discussing the relation between man and woman. Women, she claims, occupy the second sex, since femininity is how the masculine defines itself, by enumerating the things that is not and projecting them onto the other. De Beauvoir opens the first chapter of the second sex with the idea that women are a womb, an ovary, terms that are viscerally uncomfortable to read for anyone aware of the modern, trans-exclusionary, radical feminist movement. However, she immediately problematizes this idea of the role of the female sex by discussing many other species who reproduce in a variety of ways that fall beyond this anatomical definition, as well as the history of ideas about reproduction. Simone de Beauvoir's thoughts on sex and gender are, by modern standards, not the best, but the important thing to note is that she posits that men consider women to be the other, a group with definite and innate traits that are mostly, but not entirely, undesirable. By this definition, they seek to define maleness as the set of traits that are opposite to the traits that they ascribe to women. I think that this idea has some validity to it, especially in how it explains how society sees masculinity as the default, or even the superior condition. We can see this in the differing treatment of women who act tomboyish or masculine, and men who act effeminate. Neither of these are particularly normalized by society, but the latter is often much more heavily stigmatized than the former. To be masculine, for a woman, is in some ways seen as attempting to assume a positive, active, or even strong role. There are limits to what society considers as acceptable masculinity in women, but even in those cases, they're seen as attempts to assume a male social or sexual role. Butch lesbians are often assumed to be rejecting femininity as a surrogate for rejecting male attention, and adopting masculinity as a means of assuming the male position in a partnership. While that's largely bogus, it's also not as inherently dangerous as the treatment that is given to feminine men. If masculinity is considered the default, then some amount of masculinity in women can be attributed to chance or just their standard behavior. However, it also brings the assumption that if a man is in any way feminine, that was an active choice to stray from that masculine default. Furthermore, since the implicit notion of masculinity is strength of body and will to a lot of bigoted minds, femininity in the man can represent a degradation of the nobility and worth of that man. This specific stigma is clear from many common insults used against sensitive, kind, or just generally non-toxic men on the internet. The funniest of these, in my opinion, is soy boy, an insult that rests on the false assumption that soy isoflavones have a feminizing effect on the body. Now, masculinity in women is stigmatized, with women, especially women of color, often being called mannish or volatile as a means of beating them down and dismissing their opinions. I don't want to minimize that in any way. However, the slightest aspects of femininity are often mercilessly criticized in men. Some of the most extreme examples are the ideas that ordering a dessert, having any skincare whatsoever, or knowing how to do laundry is somehow an indication that a man is feminine, which is often paired with the assumption that the man is gay. When we consider the difference in the ways that gender nonconformity is treated, I think that we can understand the disparity of why trans women are treated so much differently than trans men. You see, transphobes assume that trans women are really men, and that trans men are really women. This sort of bigotry can come from many angles, 
leading to vastly different understandings of their psychology, all of which are wrong and harmful. Many gender-critical feminists, that is, transphobes who believe that they're feminists in the context of cis women's existence only, assume that trans men and non-binary people are lesbians whose internalized homophobia and misogyny at their same-sex attraction has led them to believe that they simply aren't women. This, of course, not only erases all gay, asexual, bisexual, and pansexual trans men and non-binary people who are not exclusively attracted to women and femmes, but also disregards the experience of many cis lesbians. However, the core of this misconception, I think, traces back to the idea that women are societally perceived as worse than men, and that lesbians are perceived as unfeminine. TERFs think that trans men are victims of societal prejudice, which they are, just not in the way that these people think. However, they often see trans women as predators themselves. Since their assumption is that masculinity is something which one would not ever willingly give up, trans women are often seen as men who have sexually failed. Not truly masculine, they're not able to assume the role that they were supposed to have. However, they can never be truly feminine in the eyes of transphobes either, leaving them to be considered both failures as men and as women. Simultaneously too feminine to be a man and too masculine to be a woman, trans women are societal rejects of the highest degree. Let's look at the popular image of a trans woman competing in female sports. As a failed man, she's clearly no match for the male competitors, but as someone who's more masculine than a woman, she's seen as supernaturally advantaged over women. Since women are the second sex, it would make no sense for a man who occupies the position of societal dominance to willingly lower himself to the level of a woman. Thus, the transphobe constructs a narrative where even the most feminine parts of a trans woman are expressions of masculine domination over women. And for trans women who choose to take part in martial arts, their desire to live as a woman full-time, even in the octagon or on the dojo floor, is seen as a sublimation of the masculine desire to violently dominate women. This, I think, is why trans feminine people receive the brunt of scrutiny in the debate over trans people in sports. If they were viewed as a woman trying to compete against men, as trans men sometimes are, it could be an inspirational story, proof that women can be equal to men despite any natural disadvantages. But trans women are viewed as men lowering themselves to the role of female, and if they're willing to undergo this humiliation, they must be looking to gain some advantage out of it. In sports, this is usually assumed to be the testosterone advantage, which trans athletes are presumed to have regardless of their actual hormone levels. And outside of sports, this is often assumed to be a predatory or narcissistic advantage. In martial arts should be a space that is open to transgender people. In fact, given the prominence of violent hatred towards trans people, and trans women in particular, I think that self-defense is especially necessary for the trans community. This is why I think it's important to understand transphobia and transmisogyny in the community so that we can work to combat it. Martial arts can be a source of empowerment for all of those who are stigmatized by society to be able to improve oneself without submitting to the idea that one's gender, race, or class makes them less worthy of success. And that includes transgender people. Fortunately, the state of societal acceptance of transgender people is increasing, with more people being introduced to their existence in a way that hammers home that trans people are just the same as cis people in terms of their fundamental personhood. But there's still a long way to go. The next time you're in the dojo, take a moment to reflect on the shared humanity of everyone training with you. And for those karatekas out there specifically, never forget that karate begins and ends with respect. And that includes respecting trans people. This was certainly a long video, and it was majorly stressful to research since the subject matter is really dark. If you made it to the end of the video, congratulations. I hope it was informative. Please give it a like if you enjoyed it, and if you're a trans martial artist, or if you know a trans martial artist, I would greatly appreciate a comment about how that's shaped your training and your community. This time only, please add the hashtag karate ni sente nashi to your comment so that I know that you made it all the way through to the end. And while I usually don't have to worry about this, on the off chance that this video gets any bigoted comments, I will delete them since I want this video and my channel to not be a dangerous space for trans people. I would also greatly appreciate it if you subscribe to this channel and hit the notification bell so that you see when I post new videos. I've been the Goju Ryu Philosopher, and stay safe out there.